The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. This is an interesting entry for the Zelda series, known for motion-controlled sword play and an exceptionally controversial reception in its fanbase. Skyward Sword's often seen as a blemish on the franchise, and considered the weakest 3D entry by a large margin. On the other hand, a lot of people love this game, and the magic and warmth it inspires. This is easily one of the most divisive major Nintendo releases ever. I can understand both sides of the argument. Ultimately, whether or not this game works for you comes down to what you value most about the gaming experience. But even considering that, it's hard to deny just how all over the place this game is. In this video, I'm going to lay out what I found to be the best and the worst aspects of this game. Be warned that full spoilers for The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword are on the table. The best. Number 1. Characterization. Skyward Sword has pretty good characters for a Zelda game. The primary duo, Link and Zelda, have a pre-existing relationship this time as friends and students, ensuring their bond feels stronger and more personal than ever. Link's especially likable, and the most expressive a realistic Link's ever been. Zelda's similarly endearing, feeling both intelligent and capable. Combined with an appealing design, this is one of her best iterations in the series. Her connection with Link feels natural, so you can actually get into the narrative of wanting to reunite them. Link also has a well-conveyed connection with his sword companion, Fi, whose unique way of speaking and enchanting design already solidify her as a series icon, radiating the grace and majesty of the Master Sword beautifully. Granted, her eccentric presentation brings some baggage along with it, and we'll get to that, but by the end of the game, I was attached enough to find her farewell scene pretty touching. Impa plays her two roles very well, the first as a protective warrior and the second as a guiding old woman. These are both inspired designs that feel mysterious. While Groos is overtly unlikable at first, he undergoes an arc that surprisingly works better than you'd think, redeeming him by the end of the story and ending up being a rather memorable part of it. Character designs worth highlighting all around. Everyone stands out in their own way with different shapes and palettes. The primary antagonist, Girahim, in particular makes a striking impression. But unfortunately, as as a character, he leaves a lot to be desired. By the end, he just comes off as vain and incompetent, and the one-note final boss demise doesn't fare much better. Number 2, Skyloft. The only real town in the game, Skyloft's a charming place with eccentric residents. A town in the clouds isn't something you see too often, making it feel very whimsical. Interiors express a lot of personality and are not only cozy, but believable. Enough buildings are here to make it convincing enough as a town, and it helps that each NPC has has their own unique design and name. Although side quests are almost all fetch quests, they're still fulfilling to complete since they change the world in some way. It's nice when your actions feel like they make a difference. The bazaar is appreciated for putting all of your needs in one convenient place. Skyloft has nice touches scattered all around. Accidentally throw a cat off the island and be shocked when it flies back with its ears. Fall off the island yourself? A Sky Knight rescues you instead of magically reappearing without context. Although that does happen in other areas. You flush after using the bathroom, the only bathroom in the whole town. The town could be bigger. I have no idea what these people are eating besides pumpkins, but this is an instant classic for a town hub and an unforgettable part of the Skyward Sword experience. Number three, time shift stones and the sand ship. Of all the puzzles in Skyward Sword, by far the most imaginative are those involving the time shift stones. Striking these stones causes the surrounding area to turn back to ancient times. It's a fun mechanic with thought-provoking puzzles. The concepts stretched a great deal, constantly introducing new ideas using the stones. Skyward Sword's dungeons are all solid, but the sand ship's a notch above the rest, not only for its novel setting, but also for being the most intricately designed, with a single time shift stone placed on the mast that changes the entire ship at once. It's a standout set piece of Skyward Sword, and one of the most worthwhile ideas the game offers. The lead up to the boss fight's also very well done, as the ship starts tilting and filling up with water while being a attacked by giant tentacles. The fight itself is a little dull, but the creativity of the Time Shift Stones is more than enough to secure this as the best dungeon of the game. Number 4, Kaloktos. Kaloktos rocks. Look at this thing. Awesome and freaky, with multiple mechanical arms and a creepy, empty expression. Weaving in and out of its attacks while pulling it to pieces makes this one of the most active, fast-paced fights in the series. The exceptional sound design ensures every action feels empowering and 
and leaves an impact. And don't forget the destructive columns around the arena that lend it even more spectacle. A lot of Skyward Sword's bosses aren't very flexible in how they can be fought, and while still true for Kalaktos to some extent, this fight's far more engaging than the others because it feels more dynamic, so the boss actually comes off as threatening. Plus, this happens when you beat it. <laughs> 10 out of 10 boss design. They did a great job with this one. Number five, music and visuals. Skyward Sword's soundtrack is pleasant enough that it's worth calling out. Set pieces are accentuated spectacularly by these compositions. The deserts dry, the forests bursting with life, and darkness on the horizons all well supported by the music. The songs taught throughout the game are catchy and capture the different themes of Din, Nehru, and Feroor wonderfully. Music will even subtly change while walking through areas such as the bazaar stalls or when moving through different time periods in the Sand Sea. Most importantly, the soundtrack pairs really well with this colorful, soft aesthetic. Areas look pretty nice, with an artistic style like you're viewing an oil painting. It's all clearly conveyed, enemies stand out, items are noticeable from a distance, and several spots give you a lovely view of the area. While it can look rough at times, overall it's aged quite well, using effects to create a sense of mood and atmosphere. Following a mysterious being through the night, sneaking by enemies in a fiery lair, collecting tears in a silent world. These moments wouldn't work nearly as well without effective art direction and sound design, and will linger in your memory a lot longer because of it. It's also worth mentioning, The Beatles, a creative new item that's pretty fun to use, and the claw shots feel better than ever to leap around with. But that does it for this game's best qualities. There's still a lot to discuss about Skyward Sword, so it's time to shift gears. While 3D Zelda games all have weaknesses, I've never seen one make so many questionable decisions that it drags down the entire experience. The worst. Number one, reiterating and handholding. Linearity isn't inherently a bad thing, and there's nothing wrong with the linear nature of Skyward Sword, but it crosses a line when you stop and look at the sheer amount of handholding and regurgitated information this game presents you with. Skyward Sword's a little too eager to railroad you through the adventure, and considering how many options you have to figure out the path forward, it didn't need to be like this. A gossip stone that directly tells you how to progress is available from the very beginning as well as a fortune teller who also offers guidance. And let's not forget the oh-so-magical dousing mechanic that turns exploration into following a glowing circle. These elements are on top of how streamlined the progression already is, to the point where it feels like babying. The developers were clearly scared of the player getting stuck, and the most infamous contributor to this point is Fi, someone a lot of players end up hating because of how often she interrupts to explain basic things. A lot of people claim she ruins puzzles, but most of the time she doesn't. She's just incredibly obnoxious about making sure you know what you should be doing at every moment. And a huge portion of her dialogue could be taken out entirely. One of the most baffling examples of her support is in the third dungeon when approaching the boss door, she explains what a boss door is. When you've already dealt with them twice, she constantly asks if you want something re-explained, even though it's never complicated, and continues to remind you of your next destination when it was just laid out. The most aggravating interruption she gives, and one that does ruin a puzzle, is directly telling you that you can shoot the time shift stone through the metal bars on the sand ship, robbing you the satisfaction of figuring it out for yourself. When you grab the boss key, she even reiterates where the boss door is, when she already pointed it out to you when you passed by it earlier. This is a far cry from the dungeon design of older Zeldas. She ends up feeling like a babysitter, even chiming in to tell you when your hearts are low or the Wiimote batteries are are about to run out, when that's already expressed on screen with distracting indicators. Skyward Sword's too afraid you'll get lost or frustrated, but trying so hard to prevent that only causes frustration for those that don't need it. This game gives you plenty of options for help already, so there's no reason to front load it into every player's experience. Number two, the sky. The sky in Skyward Sword. Sounds like an important thing to nail, doesn't it? Well, I'm shocked at just how uninteresting they managed 
managed to make it. The sky is way too empty, and its visuals certainly don't help. This is ugly to look at. It's like flying through a bunch of dust and coffee foam. And like I said, there's barely anything in it. Skyloft's pretty separate from everything else, so the only things really in the sky are a few places for minigames, story progression, and the lumpy pumpkin. Which, to be fair, is a cute place, but the only location besides Skyloft that feels worthwhile. The sky's largely devoid of interesting things and surprises. Flying around's also pretty tiresome, making it a slog to get around. Having to use motion controls just makes it feel like work. Tornadoes are pointless and only waste your time. Most of what you'll find are rocks with barely anything on them, outside of the odd treasure chest here and there. But that's it! For being one of the major themes of the game, it's pathetic how unfinished it feels. Once you're over the novelty of flight, which doesn't last long, it's easy to see just how superficial this addition is. It adds so little to the game overall, but the sting of wasted potential is what really hurts. Just a complete waste. Number 3, Combat Design. One-to-one -one sword plays the big feature of Skyward Sword, and put plainly, not well executed. Misread inputs are a common occurrence, and combined with the enemy design, combat quickly becomes clumsy and frustrating. The focus on one-to-one -one sword play not only ensures repetitive enemy design, but is a horrible pairing to unreliable motion controls. Slashing at openings is a great idea on paper, but enemies react so quickly that half the time you'll be blocked even if there was a clear opening when you attacked, squandering the entire concept of the system. And it happens constantly. It feels like you're being punished for playing the game the way it's intended. Sometimes, when tons of enemies are around, slashing recklessly ends up being the more effective strategy, since the sheer volume of inputs shuts them down faster than playing their boring, inconsistent blocking game. Quadro Baba's attack so fast that you're encouraged to abuse the system by continually slashing until its mouth happens to line up with your hit. It can never attack you if you just keep slashing. Staldras are the same, since their heads always reform in a horizontal line, just spam sideways cuts to prevent them from acting so they can reform and get one shot. This is really poor enemy design that encourages abusing the system. Holding your sword to the right and slashing in that direction anyway so your attack comes in from the left is cheating the system and doesn't feel good to do, but you're often punished when trying to play fairly. Enemy design's completely uninteresting, since the only way the game increases challenge is by giving them more health and directions to block in. Some enemies are so rigidly designed they feel like the same fight every time. Combat's repetitive, and therefore isn't engaging, and this is true for a lot of the boss fights as well. Playing dirty is rewarded, and since items are rarely used in combat, it gets old fast. Just keep slashing in the right direction, removing any sense of action or thought from battle, so enemies are just a waste of time. Number 4, Filler and Pacing. Skyward Sword centered around three areas, a forest, mountain, and desert. Typical locations for a Zelda game, but stretched so far here, they're completely worn out by the end of the game. The initial adventures through these places are solid, but after conquering them and wondering where the game will take you next, instead you have to go back to those same three places again, just to look for something else. There are new places to visit in these regions, but it completely destroys the momentum that was building by presenting familiar locations with a bunch of running around. The kicker is, once you're done going through these areas a second time, expectations are dashed yet again, not only from going to the past where there's absolutely nothing to do, but having to return to those same three areas again to collect more plot-progressing contrivances. Having to revisit every place for a third time is absurd, and a massive blow to motivation when you're deep into a game that clearly has nowhere to go at this point. Expectations and flow are a mess in Skyward Sword, and the game never gives back for everything you put in. Contrived sequences are non-stop for the sake of content and stretching the playtime to its absolute maximum. You have to run around Elden Volcano no less than four times throughout the game. Sneaking around to get your items back is a cool scenario, but escorting a robot to the top of the mountain because he landed in the wrong place and is too lazy to fly back up is straight up insulting. They're not even trying to hide how much this is filler. The Sansi is not much better. While it's a cool setting, you're just meandering to different places without any focus. It's content for content's sake, and the way it's framed doesn't try to hide it. The worst sequence in the entire game is a forced trip all the way back to the end of the first dungeon to grab some special water. Absolutely unbelievable. This is such blatant padding, I can't believe it's in the game. Finally, we come to the Imprisoned, an awkward, miserable boss you have to fight three times throughout the game. Garahim's also fought three times, and is also disappointing 
acting as the boss of multiple dungeons. Bosses are something to look forward to. Who wants to conquer a dungeon just to face something they've already fought before? That's this game in a nutshell. It makes you think that persevering will eventually pay off, but honestly, that moment never comes. Number five, a lot of little things. I'm just gonna list these off. There's an optional metal that increases drops, but also prevents you from opening your pouch. Sadly, multiple times throughout the game, you're required to use bottles to progress, which are in your pouch, forcing anyone using this metal to go all the way back to Skyloft to exchange it every time so you can progress. Ideally, an optional item like this wouldn't get in the way of anything essential to moving forward. Storing items is a cute idea, but kind of pointless in execution. Why not just have the items on link so you can switch them out anytime? Upgrading items is a better idea, but not a lot of upgrades are actually useful, so it ends up feeling like it exists just to have things for you to collect. Needless wastes of time are constant, such as the camera interrupting to show when something's been bombed, or Fi giving instructions every time you descend into an area. Hero modes unfortunately locked behind completing the game once, which is never an appreciated practice. Heart pieces and upgrades have poor value as rewards, since everything's already so easy. It says a lot that I'd rather attack a bomb to blow it up immediately than wait for it to explode on its own. Health is just that expendable. Crawling underground to fight these one-note centipedes is mind-numbingly boring and repeated far too many times. Lastly, we come to a thoroughly unenjoyable minigame. Inaccurately, infuriatingly, playing on a harp with the most demanding, unresponsive, poorly conveyed directing and controls I'm shocked to say is in a Zelda game of all things. <sighs> I had a lot to get out, and frankly, my most recent playthrough of Skyward Sword made me more aware of its flaws than ever. It's a shame just how unwilling this game is to trust the player, deviating from the more open roots of the series while not contributing much of value to it. Skyward Sword's not as bad as I'm making it sound, but its problems have to do with the most critical elements of effective Zelda game design. There are still things to appreciate here. The characters are endearing, the world's easy on the eyes, and it's host to some really cool puzzles. I'd recommend this game to someone with tempered expectations, who can enjoy a slow experience that's wholesome when you get into it. However, if Skyward Sword doesn't interest you, it's not at all a must-play, but that doesn't mean you won't end up liking it. Thank you all so much for watching. If you liked my video, subscribe to my channel and consider supporting my work on Patreon. Thank you so much to my patrons for your support. I'll see you next time.